Gaming on the Fringe. Now normally in this series I look at actual physics or at least physics theories, but in this entry we're going to have some fun. It's Halloween so let's look at something in that vein. We're going to examine the science and technology behind catching ghosts. And yes, I know in all likelihood ghosts don't exist, though I personally do tend to be a tepid believer. This entry is just for fun after all. Let's look at some examples from games. After decades of growing pale skin as Brother's Shadow, poor Luigi Mario finally got a game of his own and one that was actually fun. The story goes that Luigi wins a mansion in a contest he doesn't particularly remember entering, and it turns out to be haunted. Mario gets his dumbass kidnapped, so Luigi heads in to find his missing brother. Unfortunately, the house happens to have a crap ton of ghosts, and they're not boo, so you can't stare at them or back away. Luigi is attacked, defenseless, until Professor E. Gadge shows up with a mighty Poltergust 2000 and sucks those ghosts up. He hands Luigi his ghost catching gear, and it sets up the game proper. Equipment's fairly simple. It's a vacuum cleaner backpack with a flashlight. It has the added benefit of making Luigi actually look like a standard Ghostbuster. The ghosts of this game and the boos that show up later are damaged by light. When exposed to a strong light beam, their hearts are exposed, which Luigi can then suck up. Somehow, Egad modified his vacuum to be able to suck up ghosts out of dirt and weed smoke so they don't get caught. Interestingly, you do have to dump the ghost out after each level, which Egad turns into paintings. It's like a reverse Vigo. Besides your poltergust, Egad also gives you a modified Game Boy Color called a Game Boy Horror. Apparently, he stuck a whole computer in there because the thing now operates as a map communication device and a camera to scan your surroundings. The cameras apparently are spirit cameras that can not only see the ghost you can't, but can scan them to get a comment from them, take the picture, talk to them, then kick the crap out of them. Sounds like a fun party. PS2 game Ghost Hunter, rookie detective Lazarus Jones is sent to an abandoned high school with his partner Steele to investigate calls from construction crews that the place is way haunted. In it, he finds a large strange machine in the basement being, you know, the idiot. He turns it on. This is all the ghosts in hell, including the main villain, who promptly kidnapped Steel, said in the game of motion. Luckily, the machine has an AI that gives Jones the training and the weapons to operate as a ghostbuster. I mean, ghost hunter. Besides a rather yellow jacket, Jones is first equipped with a pulse rifle. Fortunately, it's not an M41A pulse rifle like a clone marine would be used, but instead works by absorbing ghost energy from, well, ghosts, and then firing it back at him. You later get a sniper rifle that operates on the same principle, as well as the spectral lasso, which uses an energy whip that looks exactly like a proton. The unique thing about these weapons is they still do minimal damage unless you use the grenade. A grenade in this game isn't exactly something that goes boom, but instead a device which anchors a spirit in the material realm, thereby making it susceptible to being shot in the face. While the ghost energy weapons do more damage, while under the grenades effect, even regular guns will damage a ghost. Once you took out enough of a ghost power, it gets sucked in the grenade in a really cool spherical effect. For once in a game like this, the ghost energy does more than give you ammo. The energy actually powers the device you broke in the beginning, as well as providing power to operate the AI companion that helps you out. Now let's look at the real world science behind the most famous equipment ever for catching ghosts. Warning, here comes some science content. Let's talk about a bit of basic particle science. Quite a bit of it runs from the old edge to the opposite the track, as opposite the charged molecules attract each other while light charged particles repel. Charges represent a positive, neutral, or negative. Positive charge is provided by the subatomic particle proton, found in the nucleus of the atom, which is the center of it. The negative charge comes from electrons that orbit the nucleus. Also found in the nucleus can be neutrons, but as the name implies, they're neutral, so they don't affect the charge of the atom. Normal atoms are neutral in charge and they possess the same number of protons and electrons, but sometimes electrons can jump out of the orbit or an atom can gain electric, an extra proton. This makes it a charged atom known as an ion. Now this is normal matter, which is called baryonic matter, but that's a different article. However, there's an opposite form of matter called antimatter. I've discussed negative matter in previous videos, but that's not the same thing. Antimatter still has a positive mass, but it's the opposite charge of normal matter brother. The anti-electron of the positron has a positive charge, with the anti-proton is negative. Now, antimatter is very hard to find in nature, when it comes into contact with normal matter, they annihilate each other in energy. In remember previous videos, you know matter to energy conversion is the mass involved times the speed of light squared. Light travels 186,000 miles per second, so that's a lot of energy for a small amount of matter. The problem is even in an empty space, there are particles zooming around so much that antimatter disappears quickly. We can make it, but it's the most expensive stuff since on Earth at over $1 trillion per gram. You can only contain it for short periods via magnetic fields, but I'll get to that later. So why did I bust out high school physics? Because it'll help ground what I'm going to describe. In Ghostbusters universe, ghosts are made up of ectoplasm, which has a negative charge. When Spangler and Stance look at the information gathered from the ghost in the library, they realize this fact can be exploited. Enter the proton pack, the gold standard ghost catching equipment. The proton pack is described as an unlicensed nuclear accelerator, which is exactly what it does. It is unique in that it separates the electron and proton of atoms, and accelerates out the positive charged stream of particle, which can hit a negatively charged ghost and ensnare it. At the bottom of the backpack is a roughly one foot diameter disc 
which the actual particle accelerator resides, which is called a cyclotron. This works by speeding particles off charged plates and circles until it reaches the speed the scientist desires. It's called as much because the particles cycle through two tracks for leaving the unit. Now, such size cyclotrons do exist in real life, but are far more heavy than what's shown in Ghostbusters. We're talking forklift required, not a backpack Alice frame. Today, most scientists use an upgraded model called synchrotron that syncs the acceleration, which is why the reboot actually uses these instead of a cyclotron. Now, the equipment is called a positron collider in the first film, which means it uses antimatter electrons for the most part. These are, of course, positively charged, so they do the work. A particle collider is often just another term for a particle accelerator. Most experiments just involve slamming particles into each other near light speed. The actual gun portion of a pack is called a particle thrower, or neutrono wand. Particle thrower makes sense, but neutrono isn't a word that has any science connotation. Maybe they meant neutrino, but those are subatomic particles that very, very rarely interact with normal matter. For example, the average human gets their 10th birthday before the first neutrino will ever hit one of their atoms. All this comes together to fire that stream we're all familiar with. Interestingly, the entire stream is positively charged, the intersection of the stream of protons, while the lightning crackling on the outside is all positrons. Normally, antimatter and matter make a serious kaboom, but in the presence of light charges, it keeps them apart. However, this does explain why any object shot with a proton pack gets set on fire or exploded. Alright, so let's say you get the ghost in your target and hits the stair by your pack. What do you do now? So we pull out the trap. Trap is a small box that does exactly what it says on the tin. You maneuver your snare ghost over it, activate it with a handy foot pedal, and the ghost is trapped inside. The trap works by projecting a cone of positive energy which both contains the ghost as well as pulling it down into the trap. The ghost is then held inside the trap by the walls being positively charged. The containment unit, which is where the captured ghosts are deposited into after a job, works on the exact same principle, only scaled up much higher. The use of charged fields is actually exactly how it contain animator in the real world, only far easier and apparently cheaper. While in the real world our record for animatic containment is just under 17 minutes, the Ghostbusters have no trouble keeping Ghost stored indefinitely, unless some dickhead from the EPA shows up. Essentially, the Ghostbusters franchise has taken Star Trek-style, scientifically plausible sound and techno babble, and using it to update the classic ghost-chasing comedy from the 30s. While most of the technology is even beyond today's science 30 years later, if possible at all, it's an interesting take on how to get rid of those bothersome spirits. Now, one thing I don't mention is the infamous total protonic reversal, as I have no idea how this could translate into real science, nor does the franchise explain it very well. Nothing else, just remember, don't cross the streams. If you enjoy this little overview of how ghostbusting technology exists in some of our favorite fiction. Do I think any of this will work in real life? Probably not, even if ghosts are real. But it's a fun thing to do on Halloween, and it's a nice way to look at basic particle science in a way that you normally wouldn't see. As always, if you have comments below, check me out on my Twitter at I think I broke it or in the comments below. And as always, thanks for watching.